to the lecture. Now this week we're going to talk about Six Sigma variation. W. Edward Deming called variation the enemy of the process. And what better place to have this lecture than at my local golf club on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. Now golf is the ultimate game of variation. What we see is that there's five inputs to the process. There's the man, i.e. the golfer, the machine, the golf club, the material, which is say your golf ball, and the method, how they're going to swing the club. And then there's also in golf uh, the fifth element, which is the environment. And all of those have to be controlled in order to reduce the variation in the process. Yes. What we're going to look at is we're going to see how those elements are common to other processes, such as manufacturing and service processes. So let's have a look at those in more detail. So we can see what the effect is of reducing variation in golf by going to the practice screen. In this example with the golfer chipping from the same position, using the same club, on the same putting surface, in the same environment, the variation is reduced. After some practice in refining the method or technique, the golfer can hit the target. And to continue on our discussion from the golf course, where we identified golf as probably one of the the best examples of variation. There's so much variation in golf that golfers that were number one in the world, you know, less than a year ago have maybe dropped down several places. Or maybe golfers that won major championships have dropped out of the top 50 or top 100. And what we see in golf is that there's a number of factors have to come together in order for the ball to go into the hole. And um, we identify these as the five M's, which are shown here, and I have a laser pointer. So the man or woman, uh, the machine, the material, the method, and the measurement. So the machine could be the tools and equipment, i.e. the golf club, materials, the parts or materials, which maybe you could argue is the golf ball or the putting surface. The method, which is the technique that the golfer uses. And then there's measurement and how it's measured and the instructions that guide that process execution. So just to follow on from measurement, we have um, two definitions of measurement in Six Sigma. Now these terms are used interchangeably in, I suppose, day to day speak but in the scientific and engineering world and the quality world we make a distinction between accuracy and precision accuracy is how close a particular measurement is to the correct true value so we can see here that you know if we use the dartboard analogy you know we've got a target if we use the golf analogy we're really trying to get the ball into the hole and how accurate we are depends on how well we play but we could be centered around the target. That would be considered to be pretty accurate. But we also could be precise. Now, pre precision is repeatability, how close the measured values are to each other. So by definition, we usually need more than one value. We could be precise, but not accurate, as the example shown here. Now, over here on the left of the slide, you can see, you know, centered around the target, we're both accurate and precise. We could be centered around the target so we're accurate, but we're, we're not precise. Uh, we could be precise, but not accurate. Again, another example here will be your watch is maybe f exactly five minutes fast. Or we could be neither accurate nor precise. The good news in Six Sigma is that we can define a lot of these areas to be a process. We can then map the process inputs and process outputs. So we can see here that we've once we've got a process, we have a set of inputs. Now we can have controllable inputs, things we have control over, and then we have uncontrollable inputs. So for example, in golf, one of the areas we don't have a lot of control over is the environment. So the wind speed, direction, and so on. Um, but in your manufacturing facility, you may have no little or no control over the temperature or humidity. Maybe you don't have those control mechanisms. Um, and we put those inputs into the process and we have a set of outputs. So this output here, Y, is a function of X, these inputs. And these will be critical to quality characteristics. 
Now, if you're not sure what your critical quality characteristics are, you could ask your customer. And there's a technique in Six Sigma called the voice of the customer, which we look at a little bit more detail in the defined phase. But we then have an output, which could be a product or service. And we have ongoing measuring, measurement, monitoring and control. And then that feeds back into the process. So let's take an example that we're all familiar with. Let's say we're making toast. So another key term in Six Sigma is KPIVs, you can see here on the right. And the KPIVs are the key process input variables. So again, if we use our input output analysis from an earlier uh, slide, we can actually start mapping this toaster process. And we see what the inputs are, what the output is. So that's shown here on the next slide. So we have, again, looking at the five M's, man, machine, material, method, and measurement. So the man or woman is said is the operator. If you're working in a hotel, whoever's in charge of the toaster. Although I notice a lot of hotels have given this back to the customer now. Um, we've got the toaster itself, the machine. We got the uh, in some input variables such as time and temperature, which is critical. Maybe the age of the bread, the material the thickness of the bread or the bread type, the type of flour. So we've got a lot of variables there, some we have control over, some we don't. Usually we, the main control we have over is the time and the temperature, and we're kind of given these. Um, and the outputs really is, is the toast burnt? And is the temperature of the toast when you get it, is it warm enough? So you could argue that one of the reasons why the hotels have given this process out to the customer so they make their own toast is that really they had very little control over some of these key output variables or critical to quality characteristics. And then if you wanted to, you could maybe measure it on a qualitative scale and do a taste test from one to five. Um, let's look at another example here, which is the coffee input process output. So we have, um, again, the amount of coffee we put in, the amount of water, the temperature of the water, uh, we brew the coffee, how the material, the beans were stored, the brewing time, coffee maker, machine, coffee type. So all of these things here have to be identified and they actually all have to be controlled. So we have certain limits for each of these. So in a control plan, you would actually look and say, well, you know, how do we store it? Where do we store it? How long do we store it for? You know, what temperature is the ideal temperature for making coffee at? And companies have done well, as this Starbucks is an example, is they've They've controlled all these input variables so that once you control these, Six Sigma says you don't really have to worry about the output. The output will take care of itself. So that if you get these right on the left, the taste and the temperature on the right will be fine. And taste and temperature are critical to quality items for the customer. So you can see once you've defined a process, you can define the critical to quality, you can define the inputs, and then you can start controlling those inputs. Now, the less variation we have, the better. <clears throat> And um, one of the things that identified in Six Sigma was this idea of common cause versus special cause variation. And common cause variation is random variation. It's inherent within your process. And if you tweak or adjust the process, it increases the variation. And what we want to do is try and identify the common cause variation and differentiate it from down here what's called special cause. Now, special cause variation is non-random, it's unusual, it may exhibit a pattern, it's assignable, explainable, controllable, and, and if you adjust this process, it decreases its variation. So, for example, let's say you got a bad batch of coffee. Then that would be assignable, explainable, controllable, and if you improve your suppliers, then you will decrease the variation in the coffee. Or maybe your machine is out of calibration. But let's just say the coffee beans you get in general, people don't like the taste. Um, well, that's just sometimes you get a good batch, sometimes you get a bad batch. There's no real pattern. Um, that's called common cause variation. Maybe another example would be, let's say, your, your drive to work. Let's say your drive to work is approximately 10 minutes, plus or minus maybe two or three minutes. So you know if you leave 15 minutes beforehand, you know, on a good day you might get there in eight, on a bad day, you might get there in 14, but you'll always be on time. So it depends if the traffic lights run with you, you know, is there um, maybe unusual um, items on the road that cause you problems? 
Uh, but in general, you know, the traffic, if it moves along at its normal speed, you will get there. Now, let's say, for example, there's ice on the road that morning, or let's say there's a car crash, or let's say there's roadworks. These would all be special causes. They're non-random. Um, they are assignable. And you may have to adjust your process. You may have to take a different route. Uh, but in this case, you would be late. It might take half an hour. It might take 45 minutes. So the idea of distinguishing between common cause and special cause variation, variation is something that we're going to look at in more detail in later lectures. Okay, so that's the um, introduction to Six Sigma and variation. And the next uh, set of lectures will look at um, Lean and Six Sigma.